Welcome back to the course on data compression with deep probabilistic models. In this video, you'll learn about a very popular class of deep probabilistic models that is called a variational order encoder. You may have heard about variational order encoders before, but stay tuned nevertheless, because at least in my experience, a lot of people have misconceptions about variational order encoders, especially when it comes to their application to data compression. If you've never heard about variational order encoders before, then stay tuned too. We'll derive everything from the ground up. So let's dive in. The course is called Data Compression with Deep Probabilistic Models because these two aspects really go hand in hand. In the past few videos, we've been focused mostly on the data compression side, and we've learned several modern methods of compressing data, but we've always seen that in all of these methods, we always need a probabilistic model of our data source in order to be able to compress the data. So in this video, we'll focus more on new machine learning based methods to parameterize and learn um, complicated probability distribution over mutations over data. As a reminder, we've discussed something like this already before in this course. So for example, on problem set three and problem 3.2, you actually developed a compression method that uses a deep probabilistic model. And here you used a so-called order regressive model in order to perform compression. This order regressive model has a, the structure that's depicted down here. So it generates symbols one time after, like one symbol after the other, and it always generates them conditioned on some hidden state that evolves with each step. And what is important now to realize is that um, for each symbol, these arrows here, they represent a non-deterministic relationship. So they really parameterize, the, the hidden state always parameterizes a probability distribution. And therefore, these models really parameterize probability distributions over the messages, and therefore, they can be used for compression. So on the problem set, you use these probability distributions to define a code book using Huffman coding, but you could also use these same probability distributions now that you know about them about stream, for stream codes and to, to compress the data with a stream code. So for example, when you then apply this for compression, then for example, the decoder side would look roughly as follows. You would again um, perform the same transitions for the hidden state, but then rather than sampling from the probability distribution at each um, step or just evaluating the probability distribution at some given um, symbols, you instead um, generate deterministic output for each symbol. And you do that by first using these probability distributions to, for example, define a code book, and then you use that code book to decode some uh, bits in a compressed representation of your message. So these autoregressive models, they parameterize a complicated or a complex uh, probability distribution as follows. So autoregressive And this is a reminder from when we discussed autoregressive models, they, they parameterize a model of your data, which in this case is a sequence of symbols. And the structure of the model is that you start with the first symbol. And then after encoding the first symbol, you parameterize the second symbol um, conditioned on the first symbol. And then you parameterize the third symbol of the probability distribution over the third symbol conditioned on the first two and so on. And then this specific architecture just uh, denotes a an, com both computationally and memory efficient way to store a subset of these classes of models. Now, what's important here is that all of these models, these probability distributions, they depend on some parameters because they are parameterized by neural networks. So I'm going to denote the neural network weights of these models as theta, and these are just Generic, generally, these are just model parameters. But in the specific case, they were neural network weights. So rather than handcrafting these models, these parameters, so that they uh, you can use them for compression. What we did is you actually, on the problem set, you actually learned these parameters. And you did this by optimizing these thetas by minimizing 
um, the so-called cross entropy. The cross entropy. H between the data distribution and the model distribution, which is really now P theta. So you optimize this over theta. And then in practice, we don't really have access to the data distribution and we discussed this, but we do have maybe access to some training set so we can at least m minimize a, an empirical estimate of this cross entropy. So empirical So this was fairly straightforward with um, autoregressive models because these models literally just parameterize the probabilities of distribution over the data. Now the question that we I'd like to answer in this video is can we do the same thing with um, latent variable models? So with the same thing what I mean is can we pose latent variable models that have some free parameters, for example, some neural network weights because they're parameterized by neural networks and then learn these neural networks so that you, we can perform optimal compression with them. And now your first reaction might be, well, of course we can, why shouldn't we? But it, you will see in a minute that Latent variable models are a bit more complicated because they parameterize a probability distribution not only over your message, but also over latent variables, which are actually not part of your message. So this brings us to today's topic of deep latent variable models and scalable approximate Bayesian inference. This video will derive a fairly involved series of, of uh, modern methods for probabilistic machine learning. So in order to kind of give you an idea where all these derivations will lead to, let me start actually with a brief spoiler. So what we will derive at the end of this video will be the concept of so-called variational autoencoders, which you may or may not have heard of already. Um, these are probabilistic machine learning methods that are a form of representation learning. So you um, have some data and you want to map this data to some semantic representation space that captures important features of that data. Now, when you hear about variational autoencoders, these models are often introduced with an explanation that I sometimes find a bit misleading. So the explanation that is often given is that um, you learn in a variational autoencoder to map the data to itself. And you, since mapping, kind of, so you learn the identity function in some sense. But since the identity function is trivial really to a model, um, there's an additional constraint. And this constraint is often introduced in saying that, um, well, to make it non-trivial, you squeeze the data through a bottleneck. And then um, pictorially, the model architecture would look something like this. You have some input X and you map it with a, with a neural network to some output. And part of your training objective will be to make the output look as similar as possible to the input. So you try to learn the identity function. But at some point in, in the middle of this, um, or in between this architecture, you have a bottleneck. And what people usually mean with that is just that they say it has a lower dimension. Than the data, x or also the reconstruction x prime, which both have the same dimension. And then kind of hand-waving, the idea is that since the model is forced to, to squeeze the data through this higher dimensional input through some lower dimensional um, bottleneck, it, uh, these two parts of the network are then forced to only really learn part, learn aspects of the input data that are specific to that specific input. But um, the all parts that are kind of the same across all inputs they are in, then learned into, um, into the network architectures. So they, they will then be represented by neural network weights rather than this activation in the intermediate layer. And then in the setup, um, the two parts of this network are often called the encoder network and the decoder network. <clears throat> 
And I guess you can already guess that these networks will play a role in then the encoder and decoder if they are used for compression. So how can these models be used for compression? Well, um, these can be used for compression. So use cases of the AEs, variation order encoders for compression. Um, well, they can be used one for lossless compression, which is what we've so far been focused on. So lossless compression. And they are actually used for these types. So here, the idea would be that you um, first map the input data to what's called the latent representation. So the, you can think of them, roughly speaking, as the activations in this inner layer. But we'll see in a minute a kind of better picture for them. So you map them, the input to this semantic representation, and then you encode that. And then um, you can map oops, C to its reconstruction. And now this reconstruction will in practice not be perfect. So you will, since you squeeze the data through a bottleneck, you will not be able to reconstruct the exact original input data. So you will then have to encode this residual. Also, and the hope is kind of that this residual is uh, rather small, or if you think about compression, that it has low entropy because most of the data is already captured by the reconstruction itself, so that encoding this part will only take up a few bits. But an, also an important application of these variational order encoders is for lossy compression, which we will cover in the next video. And here, the idea is that you just leave out the residual. So you just encode this uh, representation Z, and you just um, live with the fact that um, on the decoder side, when you then decode Z and map it back, or map it to the reconstruction, that the reconstruction will be similar to the input, but not exactly the same. So in both of these methods, you will have two training objectives. The first one will be that um, there, obviously, in both in in lossy and in lossless compression, you want this reconstruction to be close to the um, to the original data. In lossy compression, you want uh, this residual to be small because um, then a, then your compression method has a, a lower distortion; it doesn't change the data as much. But also in lossless compression, you want the residual to be small because then you can kind of expect that it has low entropy, so that you can encode this residual in fewer bits. So in both cases, in some, and I'm being a bit vague here on purpose, um, we will want the decoder network, so which maps from Z back to X prime, it should reconstruct the data well. So to make residual x prime minus x either small or low entropy. But then also your second objective will be that you will want the um, encoder network to decorrelate the data. So what do I mean with that? So when you map the input data to this representation, the semantic representation Z, and then you encode the semantic representation, then you need a probabilistic model of the semantic representation. And we've seen that um, the, it, using compression methods for strongly correlated data becomes complicated. It's much easier to compress data if each 
symbol in this each dimension of this latent representation is statistically independent of all the others. So we don't have this property on the input. We assume that we have some input data that's maybe images where all the pixels are strongly correlated. But we want to make a mapping where in this latent representation or this semantic representation, all the dimensions are um, decorrelated. So that is so that we can then easily compress them. So that is the second um, objective that the encoder network um, or that it decorrelates the data. And for that, we really need a probabilistic model. So this um, naive picture of just describing the autoencoder as a sequence of neural networks will not be enough. We really need probabilistic models. So when I say decorrelated, what I mean with is um, we want So with decorrelate, I mean, we want the probability of Z to be a product, ideally. So we want them to be independent. And now there's, I started this discussion of variational autoencoders by this um, somewhat hand wavy argument or intuitive picture that we want to map um, the data to itself while squeezing it through a bottleneck. And this idea kind of has this intuition that, well, if we squeeze it through some low dimensional representation, then that should help us to compress the data. But I want to make it really clear that I think that is a common fallacy. So this is not actually the truth. So in fact, there are more modern compression methods that use something that's called a normalizing flow or even more modern Variants of that are integer discrete flows, and they actually map the input data to a representation that is then compressed, but this representation has exactly the same dimension as the input data, and yet it can be easier compressed than the input. And it can it reduces like, applying simple compression methods to this representation, which has in these models the same dimension as the input, will still lead to a lower bit rate than if you were, were just to compress the input. So it's not really about reducing the dimensionality. And in fact, this dimensionality, um, just the fact that this bottleneck has a lower dimension isn't necessarily even, uh, doesn't even necessarily mean that you compress the data. So you can, there exist actually mappings that can take arbitrary input data from some high dimensional space, and they can map it to a lower dimensional space such that they are invertible. So you can then take this and they're exactly invertible. So the exact same information that's in the input space is also in the output space. So just this idea that you reduce the dimension has nothing to do really with compression. And I realized when I gave this uh, lecture in live that um, this was actually obvious to some of the students. So maybe if you've been following along with these videos, this may be completely obvious that, well, if you want to think about compression, you have to think about information theoretical concepts like uh, the entropy of these uh, of this representation. But when I hear people talk about variational autoencoders and other, and other concepts, I hear that quite a lot, this uh, wrong intuition that um, just the fact that you squeeze them through a bottleneck would lead to some sort of compression. So I want to make it really clear that squeezing data through a lower dimensional bottleneck has nothing to do really with compression. So let me actually state that formally. So um, note, um, the important note is that just the squeezing data through a low dimensional or lower dimensional, I should say, that does not in itself imply compression. So instead, we have to think about information theoretical measures.
about information theoretical rather than the dimension. So in fact, I should say that we don't have just two training objectives, but really we have three training objectives. And so, excuse me. So the third training objective really is that we want to um, reduce or like want to um, keep the entropy of each of these symbols. So we want them to decorrelate, but also for each of these symbols, we want the entropy to be low. Or in general, we want the entropy of these latent or semantic representations uh, to be low. To enable effective compression. And again, in order to do that, we will need a probabilistic model and this naive picture of just a, a, a stitching two neural networks together will not be enough. And that's what we'll discover in, or discuss in the rest of this video. Before I get to that, I just, just as a brief remark, I mentioned these mappings that can map between injectively between um, spaces um, of uh, real valued spaces of uh, different dimensions. So one of these ma mappings is called the Hilbert curve. So the way this works is, is kind of a, it's, a, it's a fraction, it's a fractal curve where you start with a curve like this. So this would be a mapping from one dimension, which is this curve, to the two-dimensional space. And then you continuously refine this curve um, so that it becomes more and more complicated. And all I'm saying here is that um, even so, even if you have, if you start with this higher dimensional, let's say two-dimensional space, you could fully cover that with a one-dimensional curve. So just reducing the dimension does not compress anything here. And um, as a an final additional remark, uh, so these curves, exist in arbitrary dimensions, and you can even um, get a knitted version of them. This is what former colleagues of me worked on. They worked on compilers for knitting machines, and it's kind of an extreme case. They showed that you can even knit in a single piece a Hilbert curve, which then looks like this if you manage to push it all together. So this was a spoiler for this um, video. So at the end of this video, you will have a better understanding of how these variational autoencoders work and how you can really enforce these information theoretical objectives. Um, let's now finish up this kind of preview of this course, uh, this video. And uh, let's actually dive into how we can model these, uh, these deep probabilistic uh, models. And so let's get to the topic, which is the deep latent variable models. So this will be our first step towards where what we will see will end up as a variational autoencoder. And here in these models, we are going to look only at the encoder or at the decoder side of the VAE. So look at a decoder network only. So let me actually copy it. So here we have the model architecture and the decoder side is the green part. So this is the architecture that goes from Z to X. And I'm calling, I called it the decoder network in the variational autoencoder architecture, but really um, in this, if you just look at it itself, um, let's actually not call this the decoder network. Let's just think of this as some process that goes from um, Z to some output, some typically higher dimensional output. And let's actually um, therefore also not call this X prime because we have we don't think of this as some reconstruction of some input. We just think of this as some data that is generated by this uh, process. So we think of this as we just generate some data X. So we're going to interpret this now rather than taking some 
semantic representation C and mapping it to a specific data point, we're going to construct a probabilistic model that takes some C and um, constructs from it a probability distribution over this data. So interpret as a latent variable model. Um, with the following, which factorizes as follows. So it has some, excuse me, some uh, data and some latent variables. And it factorizes into a prior and a likelihood. And then this, all of these models depend on some model parameters, which I've already called theta here. So each of this part depends on model parameters theta. And these could, for example, be, um, and in variational order encoders they usually are, they could be um, neural network weights. So these are learned model parameters. Um, so for example, neural network. And we're now interested in learning and finding a way to learn optimal parameters for these uh, thetas. Um, so to make this more concrete, uh, let me give you a, like the most common example. So a example would be that um, the, the prior is a fully factorized prior. So I'm now going to, when I write down specific examples for the model, I'm going to write down the density functions, the probability density functions for these parts, because I'm now going to assume that Z and uh, in many cases also X is continuous data. So I'm going to write down the density function and I'm going to denote the densities always by lowercase letters. So that um, prior is fully factorized, which just means that under the prior, um, all components of Z are statistically independent. So um, P theta of, this is the lowercase, is the density function. So P of Z is the um, product of P theta, the densities of each one of them. And then the likelihood is um, parameterized by a neural network. And it is just a, in many cases, for example, a normal distribution around some mean, which is parameterized by the neural network. So P of density function of the likelihood is a normal distribution denoted by n um, of the value x, where the mean is some function theta, f, f sub theta of the latent variable on which we condition. And um, the variance of this normal distribution is um, diagonal in many cases, so that it's again easy to sample, for example, for that or to evaluate it. And then this, um, and this function is uh, a neural network. And this parameter sigma squared could be either fixed or learned. And here the first parameter of the, after the thing you're modeling, the first parameter here is always the mean and the second parameter is the variance of the normal distribution. So this is fixed or learned typically depending on whether you do lossless or lossy compression. And then this is a normal distribution um, or Gaussian, sometimes called a Gaussian, which um, if you're not familiar with them, they're just a class of parameterized probability distributions that um, look uh, like this, with density function um, looks like this um, 
this has this shape. So this is our normal distribution. So this is just a common example, but in more general, um, you have this probability distribution, which is a prior over this semantic representation, or now we can also call it latent representation because it's a latent variable, and then a uh, likelihood that different to the models we've looked at so far when, we've did, when we did, for example, the problem set on bit spec coding, it's no longer a fixed probability distribution, but it has some parameters, and these parameterize, parameters parameterize a neural network that uh, defines the mean conditioned on um, the input value. And now with these probability distributions, now our goal is, is to use them for compression. So uh, we want to minimize the cross entropy again. So the cross entropy between the data distribution um, of X and the model distribution of X which is just given as the expectation under the data distribution um, of the negative log, so the information content of uh, the data under uh, the model. But the problem here is this distribution, this P theta of X, if you evaluate that at some point X, that is actually only defined implicitly because the only definition that we have for this model that we can really write down as a mathematical function, the only definition is for definitions that we have are for this uh, prior, which we can write down as a mathematical function if we can write down these parts, and we can write down the likelihood. Um, but we cannot write down in closed form this marginal distribution over the data. Well, we can write down how it's defined or how we can, in principle, calculate it. It's so, again, since we have um, not continuous uh, random variables, we have to integrate over the density functions. So this is, in principle, um, how we can calculate this distribution. But in practice, this, even though it's typically lower dimensional than the data space, this is still a quite high dimensional space. And high dimensional integrals are extremely expensive. So this would be prohibitively expensive. This integral would, in most practical applications, be prohibitively expensive to calculate. So not only cannot, can't we minimum or maximize this this part this probability distribution we can't even calculate it in practice and that's uh, kind of the problem that we're going to solve in with a couple of additional tricks so but before we do that let me just write down again so we want to so we want to minimize um, the cross entropy which means due to this minus sign we want, in the rest of this video, we will be concerned in maximizing this, this distribution or the log of it, then evaluate it on the data. So we want to maximize. And this is often called this uh, log of uh, the marginal distribution of the data is called the evidence or the model evidence sometimes. Um, the evidence P of P theta of X when evaluated on, on data X from the training set. So that is our goal, but we cannot even calculate um, this probability distribution in practice. So how can we do that? Well, um, we already saw a first step towards a, a trick that we can apply in the parts of the in one of the previous videos that was about compression methods. So these compression ideas about compression methods will now help us to actually train a deprobabilistic model. So um, 
And the idea that comes in here is actually from bit spec coding. So recall um, in bit spec coding, And this is now going to become useful because if you recall the net bitrate, so of for some data, actually we just wrote it as bitrate of the message, is exactly the negative log, so it's exactly the negative evidence. So exactly this part which we want to maximize, um, but which we cannot calculate, this is exactly the net bitrate of bit spec coding. So uh, first idea you might come up with is, well, can we maybe then minimize, due to this minus sign, uh, the net bitrate of bit spec coding? And in fact, that would even be very well motivated from a compression perspective, because we want to minimize bit rates. Um, well, let's Let's see, how, how does we arrive actually at this uh, result that the net bit rate of bit spec coding is exactly the negative evidence, so the negative log of the marginal data distribution. Um, well, we saw that in bit spec coding, we have three steps. We encode, not exactly in this order, but these three steps are encoding the latent variable, and that um, costs, um, uh, that has a, costs some bit rate, which is just the, um, the probability, the negative the information content of the latent variable. Then we encode the um, data given using the likelihood. But before we even do all of that, we get this value z by decoding it from um, the posterior. So we get back some bits, which are exactly the um, information content of C under the posterior. That is how we arrived at the bitrate for bit spec coding. And now, so this is the posterior distribution. Now the problem here is then, so there's really no free lunch because, um, well, the fact that we cannot really calculate this part has to be reflected in that we, there has to be some problem with this equation now. And the problem here is that um, uh, is that we cannot calculate this posterior. So p of theta c given x. This is just the joint divided by the marginal. So again, in order to do this, we actually need the marginal. So again, um, this is intractable. But now we can think one step further. And so when we did, when I introduced the bit spec coding method in one of the earlier videos, um, we used this posterior distribution in order to get the latent variable. But that kind of was an, at that point was kind of an arbitrary choice that we used the posterior distribution. It also was only justified after the fact when we then saw that, well, if we take this choice, then the net bit rate really becomes optimal because it really becomes the information content of the data under the, its marginal distribution. So it turned out to be really optimal if you choose the posterior here. But in principle, bit spec coding would also work if you used any other distribution over um, the latent variable here, it would just not work quite as well. So it would have a net bit rate that, first of all, will then depend on C. So here we saw that magically, and in some sense, all, well, this equation seems like it depends on the value that you choose for C, but really um, all the dependency on Z fall, drops out when you write this out. So if you choose a, and this was a pr particular property of you use the posterior, now, if you use some other distribution, then suddenly your bitrate will depend on Z. Um, but also you will see that, at least in expectation, the net bitrate will then be higher because this is really the optimal net bitrate that you can get. So if you do anything else, um, well, it cannot be, get, become lower. So in, in practice, it will actually become higher. Um, but we can still do it. So let's just um, say we have an idea. Um, just use a different distribution, replace the posterior, 
which is uh, prohibitively expensive to calculate, just re replace that with some other uh, distribution, with some other distribution. And I'm going to call this distribution Q lambda of um, Z. And this lambda will, we can, we have the freedom of choosing a different distribution for every data point. So this, these lambdas are parameters of this distribution in the same sense that thetas are parameters of our model. So we can choose these lambdas differently for every, um, for every um, Z. So for example, and this is actually a common example, we could say Q lambda X of Z is just a normal distribution that's even fully factorized. So I equals one to K. Uh, a normal distribution for ZI um, with some mean and some standard deviation where these two parameters kind of for all then if you accumulate them for all I from 1 to K they make up uh, lambda X so lambda X is just a, a vector of parameters that contains all the mu's and all the sigmas for all the coordinates I equals 1 to K so that's actually a common thing but to cho choose, but it should be obvious to see that that's just one uh, kind of class of probability distributions that we could insert here instead of the posterior. And obviously this will, in almost all cases that you can think of, none of, no matter which parameters you choose, you will not be able to actually, disc uh, to actually parameterize the exact posterior here. So no matter which lambdas, which parameters lambda you take, um, this replacement of the true posterior with its uh, replacement Q lambda will not lead to the same bitrate. So instead it will lead to a different bit net bitrate. So then the net bitrate tilde, which I'm going to call, this will now depend on Z because this magic disappearance where all these Z's here um, drop, uh, conspire to drop out, this is not, will no longer be the case in general. So it will depend on Z and obviously also on the message X. And this is now basically the same equation as here, except that the posterior is now replaced by um, Q. So let me actually combine these first two terms again into the joint probability distribution. So this will be P theta of um, X being X and Z being value Z that we choose. And um, then, sorry, that's the information content, so the log negative log of that and then plus because that's the bits that we get back um q log q lambda x of z being the value c that we choose and we know that this method will now in in practice no longer be optimal so we know that an expectation so when we decode data using this probability um, distribution, that is, if we decode random data, that is equivalent to just sampling from this distribution. So an expectation, if we um, sample C from Q lambda X, um, then this net bit rate or this new net bit rate of X will be practice larger, but could in principle be the same if we happen to actually choose the posterior here, um, then the net, the net bit rate of the true bit, um, bits back algorithm, which again, as a reminder, was um, uh, the negative evidence. So marginal distribution of the data. And as a reminder, again, this is what we want to maximize. So we want to, or with the minus sign, this is what we want to minimize. when it's evaluated on data from our training set. And we also know that in this equation we have, so this is an inequality or a semi-inequality, but we have equality uh, if um, Q lambda X of C, if that is exactly the posterior distribution. for the given data point that we're interested in. So you can already see, well, if we want to minimize this part and we have some quantity that is never smaller than it, well, the idea will be that 
we will minimize this part and then we will at least be sure that whatever we get out will be an upper bound on this part. Um, but before I make that a bit more formal, let me introduce some notation and some naming conventions, just that um, in, when you read papers on variational inference, then that you will be able to understand what they, what all these things mean. So some remark on notation and naming conventions. So I already mentioned that this um, log p theta of the marginal distribution of the data, so that is called the evidence. And we want this to be high. because that will then make our information content uh, low. And now another piece of very common notation is if you now actually look at the negative of this left-hand side here. So introducing this bound using bit spec coding is actually a very unusual way to introduce it here. I'm just introducing it this way because um, we can build up on the things that we've already learned about compression. But in most literature which does which introduces these models without thinking about compression, um, you will introduce them in another way and then um, what is typically referred to as the negative of this left hand side. So negative expectation under um, this uh, replacement probability of this new net bit rate, which is um, to write it out is the expectation of C from Q lambda of C. Now I have to flip the signs, so this will be a positive log p theta of the joint minus the log Q lambda x of C equals C. This is called the evidence lower bound. And it's called evidence lower bound, well, because if you run through all the minus signs, so there's also a minus sign here, if you uh, flip all these signs, then this becomes a lesser equal sign, so you'd have, so evidence lower bound is also abbreviated as elbow, and this is an abbreviation that you'll see a lot. So this elbow, which is a function now of both the model parameters and these um, parameters of your distribution, um, is therefore less than or equal to the evidence. So to um, log p theta of x equals x, which is the evidence. And that's where this name comes from, evidence lower bound. It's a lower bound on the evidence. And these are important quantities to remember because these will appear a lot if you read papers on this, this method, which is called variational inference. And the reason for that is called that is that these parameters um, lambda lambda x lambda sub x of which is not standard notation by the way um, of um, the distribution. Sorry. This. Q lambda x of C are called variational parameters and the idea here is that you have a instead of actually taking the true posterior distribution, you kind of uh, make a guess for your posterior distribution. And but this guess has some free parameters, and then you vary these free parameters until you find uh, the best, the best fit. So the one that makes this, the gap between the left hand side and the right hand side here, um, as close as possible. So these are called variational parameters. And then um, this method is called, or the Q lambda x of C is then called the 
variational distribution. And then the idea is behind this method is to is called a variational inference. So or VI for short. Um, the idea here is just to um, find optimal values of, uh, or let me say it in this way, um, approximate um, this evidence log, log p theta of x equals x um, by um, the elbow of theta lambda x star where lambda x star minimizes, uh, I'm sorry, maximizes the elbow. So let me actually write it as an equation, lambda x star is the arc max over lambda x of um, the elbow for some given model parameters theta and um, then over lambda. So this is called variational inference because you can think of this variational distribution as an approximate posterior distribution because it found it by, um, we, we introduced it kind of as a replacement for the posterior distribution. So what you will see empirically, and we will also understand it a bit better on the problem set, is that um, observation, here I'm going to just phrase it as an empirical observation, is that um, this typically leads to a distribution, a variational distribution, Q lambda x star of Z, uh, which is will end up to be close to um, the true posterior p theta um, of c given x, where you'll see on the problem set more precisely what I mean with close. Um, but qualitatively, this shouldn't surprise you because we already know that um, this inequality here, it um, becomes an inequality if Q is the exact posterior distribution. So um, if we maximize, or here in this case, we would um, minimize this left-hand side because we still have the minus signs in here. Um, if we minimize this left-hand side, which is the same as maximizing the elbow, um, this term, then um, this will become not inequality, but roughly inequality. And you can, it shouldn't surprise you at least, it's not, it's not a proof, but it shouldn't surprise you that that will also go hand in hand with finding a variational distribution that's similar in some sense to the posterior. So that the net rate, net bit rate of this um, cheated variant of bits by coding will only then be a good approximation of the optimal bit rate if um, you replace the posterior with something that's actually similar to it. So this idea of maximizing the elbow, this one, or this idea of minimizing, which is the same thing, um, minimizing this modified uh, bit rate, the net bit rate of our modified bit spec algorithm, this idea is called variational inference. And I should give you the references here. So if you want to learn more about variational inference, I would uh, recommend the following reviews. Um, by, uh, one is by David Bly and collaborators uh, from 2016. And at the end of these lecture notes, which you can download from the, um, from the link in the video description, you will find 
a um, the precise references for all of these. And another review that I can recommend is by Chong Sheng and collaborators from the year 2018. So this was a first idea that can um, allow us to find now a um, at least um, to solve one of the problems that we have. So let me briefly scroll up. What were the problems? Just remind, let's remind ourselves what were the problems that we're trying to solve? Well, we started from this idea of minimizing the cross entropy because that's what we want to do for compression. So we want to minimize them over the model parameters theta. But then we saw, so a more simple way to think about the cross entropy is really we want to um, maximize the evidence, this log p theta of the marginal data distribution. So we want to maximize the evidence um, without the minus n here, maximize it. Um, but the problem here was then that we cannot even calculate this evidence in practice because this integral would be prohibitively expensive. So with variational inference, we've solved this first step of at least now we're, well, we cannot really calculate this thing, but we can estimate it because we can estimate it by the net bit rate of our modified bit spec coding variant, which uses a stand-in for the, uh, which replaces the true posterior by a stand-in over which we then optimize. So we solved this first problem that we cannot even calculate this thing, but now we still have to solve this problem that um, we have to now maximize over the model parameters. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, one observation that we can do, so that now um, next idea. So let me first state, kind of, so now we can now can approximate the evidence look p theta of x equals x so that was um, this part we want to approximate the evidence by the elbow um, by doing this variational inference procedure but we still have to maximize it still have to maximize it over this time over theta. And so here the idea is now just um, maximize our approximation over theta. which was the elbow of um, theta lambda x star over theta. And this may seem kind of like the obvious thing to do at first, but it's actually not that easy to do because this, the value for lambda that we'll find, it will really depend on um, on the theta, so there's um, we can only um, we can get an approximation for um, or for the evidence only after an optimization of um, over lambda, and then we can um, once we change theta in order to optimize it, we would have to find new lambdas. So how would this algorithm look like in practice? So let's write out some pseudocode. So the pseudocode goes as follows. Um, we have some outer training loop uh, where we iterate over some time steps for T in uh, training steps. And then for each training step, we first sample a mini batch. Hey. Um, going to call B of from the training set. Sorry. Then we initialize 
these variational parameters lambda uh, randomly. And we do that for all x in the mini batch. And then we have to now first maximize the elbow over lambda in order to find our approximation, to find this approximation. We have to do variational inference, and that means maximizing over lambda. So let me actually use a different color here. So um, now we have an inner loop for t prime. Again, training steps in inner training steps. We will now um, perform it. In many cases, you can't do anything smarter than just gradient-based optimization. So then you do you perform um, gradient step for lambda for all x in the mini batch. And then this step is, so this loop is variational inference, which finds our lambda x stars. And then once we found that, we um, perform a gradient step. for theta on this elbow, um, which is a function which we now evaluate, well, at theta to take the gradient, but then also at the optimized lambdas. And then, obviously, we wanted to make a lot of training of gradient steps for theta. Um, but as soon as we change theta, um, well, we have to always sample a different mini batch because um, we want to really uh, not just optimize theta to a, uh, to a specific mini batch. So theta is really shared across all data points because it is a parameter of the model. But then every time we sample a new mini batch, we have to um, find the optimal lambdas again because these really depend on the data point because these parameterize the posterior, which really depends very closely on the data point. And um, well, we could maybe remember all the all the lambdas, all those variation parameters for all uh, the training points that we have. But typically, we will have like a quite large training set. So, if until we sample, we happen to sample the same data point x again, um, our model will typically have changed. So the thetas, the model parameters theta, will typically have changed a lot. So the lambda will not no longer be 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 correct. So we have to find the then optimize again to find the correct lambda. So let me actually write that also down. So remember, so um, the theta is the model parameters. Theta are shared. They are really kind of not a property of the data point itself. So they are shared across all data points. They're global i.e. the same uh, for all uh, data points x, whereas um, the variational parameters um, lambda x, uh, they parameterize an approximate posterior or variational distribution which approximates the posterior and approximate or an approximation of pz specialized to this particular value um, thus uh, they are local i.e. different for all data points. And what we really want to do is we, our goal is we want to 
maximize the evidence. But really, we want to maximize the average, the expected evidence for all data from the training set. So we have to sample a different, we have to sample many mini batches. A new mini batch in each iteration of the outer loop. Loop. And then this invalidates the lambdas, lambda x star, the, from the previous iteration of the outer loop. So if you go back to um, here in the pseudocode, um, we start in the outer loop, we start by sampling a mini batch of training points, and then we do this variational inference for these lambdas could actually also include this part in initialization of lambdas in this variational inference part. And only once that is done, we can perform this gradient step. But then in the next iteration of the outer loop, we have to sample a new mini batch of training points. So for those, uh, the lambdas that we had in the previous iteration of the training loop don't make any sense. So we have to run this entire inner training loop again, and this will be expensive. So we have a nested loop, and this will be extremely expensive in practice. Because each step of the outer training loop is now, uh, it's not just taking a simple gradient, but it actually involves a full, um, you have to now perform a full optimization within each step of the outer optimization step itself. So this invalidates the lambda stars from previous iterations iteration of the outer loop. So we've seen that this method is not quite yet what we want to end up with because it is still too expensive, but it's still a step in the right direction. So let me actually first give you the name for this method. So this method of um, optimizing of performing inference and then or approximate inference and then in this approximate or inference optimizing the model parameters this is called expectation maximization and our uh, particular ver variant of it which uses variational inference as an approximation is called vari um, variational expectation maximization so this is called um, variational expectation maximization. And uh, the references here are, so expectation maximization in general, the method was originally proposed by Dempster and collaborators in 1977. And then this um, approximate method, which uses variational inference as an approximation, was first uh, the reference for this is uh, Beal and uh, Garamani. in 2003. And again, you'll find um, the list of all the references in at the end of the lecture notes. So how can we make this, how can we avoid this, uh, this nested setup with the, these nested training loops? Well, one idea that we could have is instead of explicitly optimizing lambda, kind of these local variables lambda every, for every new training point, can't we learn how uh, these variation parameters lambda should depend on the input? So can we learn a function that takes the input data x, um, the, the data x as an input, and then outputs an estimate of our lambdas of the optimal lambda functions that we want to have. And this is exactly the, now the uh, final step that we will add. So this is now um, final step 
additional trick is to learn learn um, how to do inference. And in particular, we will learn how to do variational inference. So we will learn a function. So what do I mean with that more precisely? I.e. learn a function um, g, which will now again have some parameters. And these will again be neural network weights, but it will be a different network. Um, and this function takes a, um, a uh, input data, x, and it maps it to latent variables, lambda x. And so then we set lambda x equal g phi of x in um, the elbow. And what we get out of that is and now, um, this is then also called the elbow, so the notation is somewhat overloaded here. So the elbow will now depend still on model parameters, but instead of individual um, individual parameters, for, like, variational parameters for each data point x, it will now just depend on these global parameters phi. So these are now global parameters, just like the theta. So these are now both, no, both are global parameters. And it is just the same as the elbow that we had. So it is the expectation where we sample C from Q, but Q is now no longer has a um, parameter phi, but it actually has this parameter, sorry, no longer has this parameter lambda, but lambda is actually now G um, phi of X. And since this is now going, getting kind of ridiculous with the double and triple indices, um, I'm going to use the standard notation where we say now say, apologies, um, notation, we will now are now going to call this um, G, sorry, Q, the probability Q um, sub, it has parameters phi now, it will be a function, a probability distribution over the latent variables as it was before. And then it's typically denoted as conditioned on X because it, um, which kind of makes sense because it really is, um, it approximates the posterior, which is also a probability over Z conditioned on X. So this notation is reminiscent of the fact that this this probability distribution approximates the posterior. So this, but it really just means nothing else than um, Q lambda X of Z with lambda X equals G phi of X. And then the elbow just becomes this part. So we are now sampling from Q phi of uh, C given X, and we are we we'll evaluate the log joint. And minus then the log Q phi of uh, Z given X. So this is the elbow, and then we will just, now that these are both global parameters, we can just, um, and it is still, the elbow is still an evidence lower bound, so it is a, still a lower bound on log p theta of x, where this is still the evidence. And we're still interested in maximizing this evidence when evaluated on data from the data distribution. So we can now just, um, since we have a lower bound on this whole evidence, we can um, approximate it optimally if we just make this 
they will not be the same, but we can um, make the left-hand side as close as possible to the right-hand side simply by um, maximizing it over both theta and phi. And with that, we make sure that um, we both close this gap, but we also, by just maximizing it to maximize eff effectively, then also this right-hand side, because that will allow us, that will give us more leeway on the left-hand side. So we'll now um, maximize and what to be more precise we maximize the expectation under the data distribution so for x from the data distribution or in practice our training set um, of the elbow and now to make it even more confusing but if you look into papers often this term itself this whole term is then also often called the elbow So you sometimes have to just, it, it will, it is usually obvious from context what exactly is meant, but just both of these can sometimes be called the elbow. So we maximize now this part over both the model parameters theta and the variational parameters phi. And this method is now called um, of learning a function that maps data to variational parameters, this is called amortized variational inference because it amortizes this inner loop, so this um, inference uh, process over all the possible data points that we have. So rather than learning it anew for each data point, we now uh, learn, um, we share statistical strength across data points and learn a single function that maps data points to their variational parameters. So um, this is now called amortized so the method of doing variational inference with such a um, um, such a learned uh, mapping is called amortized variational inference but now that we're doing expectation maximization uh, we can call this amortized variational expectation maximization So this term amortized variational expectation maximization is kind of what follows out from this no, uh, from this naming convention but you will very rarely see this this term in any papers and the reason for that is that there exists a simpler term for this the simpler term for that is simply variational autoencoders and that's exactly what we started with so this VAEs and that kind of closes the loop. So why is that really what we've now arrived at? Why is that a variational autoencoder? Let me first give you the reference and then we'll see. So this was proposed by Kingma and Welling. In 2013. And they called it autoencoding variational base, but nowadays it's mostly called variational autoencoders. So why is this variational autoencoders? Well, let's get go back to this picture. Let's actually copy this picture and let's now understand how we can um, view this picture now in a probabilistic interpretation. So let's go back. So here's our amortized variational expectation maximization. And why is that the same as variational autoencoders? Well, um, we now have in a variational autoencoders, we have this encoder network and this decoder network, and they parameterize mappings from the input to some latent representation or from the latent representation to some output. And we now have a probabilistic uh, view of all these mappings because we can say this mapping on the decoder network, so which goes in this direction, this is simply our function f theta. Um, so if you remember the likelihood we call the likelihood I gave us an example here, um, p theta of x, or actually I gave the uh, density function, um, p theta of x, x given z, 
as um, a normal distribution over x uh, centered around um, where the mean is a function f theta of x of z and the variance was in the simplest case just some diagonal variance so this function f here is a neural network that maps from uh, from the latent representation to well to means of the output but that map that li those live in the output space so if you were to for example now sample a reconstruction if you use this velocity compression and you would just try to reconstruct an image the best thing you could do is just take this likelihood this probabilistic method of creating some output and just taking the mode of it which would be exactly this mean so this is the mean so this would be the decoder network would be f theta and now we've learned um that for to make this method fast uh, we have to learn how to parameterize a probability dis the pos an approximate posterior over c given some data so that is we interpret that that is given some output what is the um the, the probability distribution over c but we can now in if we just uh, denote instead of the generative process if you just denote the data flow then we can say we can start from some data we first perform inference using this inference network so this would now be g phi so if you recall this function g sub phi its output are the variational parameters so it parameterizes our variational distribution um, it parameterizes this function variational distribution which I'm now going to write as a density g q sub phi of z given x using this conventional notation which but we saw there's really nothing else but the, this variational distribution q lambda x of z uh, with lambda where we set lambda x to the output of um, the encoder network so in this amortized variational inference setup we have a function g phi that takes some input and then outputs variational parameters and I gave you a common example for these variational distributions where they were simply Gaussian distributions so e g q lambda x of z where they were just Gaussians um, of z um, with some mean and uh, some diagonal um, covariance matrix and in this example these uh, means and these covariances were just um, these comprise uh, the variation parameters lambda x so the way to read this now is you take an input x you apply the function the encoder network to it which gives you some variation parameters and these par variation parameters in the simplest example are simply these mu's and sigmas and they therefore parameterize a distribution over z so a distribution in this space so therefore we now have a very similar picture as we had in the beginning where we uh, have two neural networks that parameterize mappings on the one hand from the input to z space and on the other hand from c space to the output but in both cases they no longer parameterize deterministic mappings but instead they parameterize uh, probability distributions so they either parameterize on the encoder side this variational distribution and on the decoder side they parameterize this likelihood function with this probabilistic formulation of an autoencoder architecture we can now address the issue that i highlighted several times at the beginning of this video where i said that um, watch out if you just um, this argument that is often made that you just have to squeeze the data through some low dimension through some low dimensional bottleneck here that doesn't really lead to compression so um, i argued that we really should look at um, information theoretical bounds so let's actually um, not care so much about um, the fact that this has a lower dimension let's instead care about information theoretical bounds and let's therefore minimize the entropy which is now something that we can do now that we have a probabilistic interpretation so we want to minimize entropy and in fact i mean since we started this whole derivation by um, minimizing the expected bit rate that is exactly what our objective already does so we minimize now the entropy of uh, this part 
this representation. More precisely, uh, what it minimizes, more precisely, it minimizes AKL divergence uh, from the prior to the approximate posterior distribution. And you will see that in a second when we write out the elbow explicitly. Another thing that you see here is that um, now that we have this probabilistic model, we're actually not um, mapping X to some deterministic C, but instead we're sampling, we're, when we write down the elbow, you will see it contains an expectation value over, um, over C. So we actually sample, we inject noise at this point, inject noise. So we inject noise here. Since we sample z from this uh, probability distribution q sub phi of z given x. So we no longer choose z um, as a deterministic function of x, but it is, when you write out the elbow, it will be sampled from this distribution. So we inject noise here, but there's no argument of how much noise you have to inject. It follows exactly, you're actually learning how much noise you have to inject. So we have now this probabilistic understanding of the variational autoencoder architecture, and we know that we train it by minimizing this elbow part. Um, so let's actually have a closer look at it, and let's actually interpret what this objective function, this elbow, means. Interpretation of, of the elbow, which is our objective function i.e. the thing that we want to maximize. And I'm saying interpretations, plural, because there are actually several ways that are all correct to look at it, but they all highlight different aspects of the elbow. So let's first write it out. So the elbow is now a parameter of the, or is a function of the model parameters theta and these amortized variational parameters phi. And it is an expectation over the um, latent variable c from this distribution, uh, from this approximate posterior distribution. I'm going to leave out the expectation over the data. So I'm assuming that we already use, in order to optimize the elbow, we already use a, um, a stochastic optimization process like stochastic gradient descent to, to and where we sample different data points in each step. So here then it's in the expectation, um, we have, it's still the negative bit rate of bits back coding. So it's still the log of um, the marginal distribution over Z, then plus the log of the marginal distribution. And I should actually write um, densities now since we're dealing with um, continuous latent variables. So plus the log of, so if you actually want to implement this, you have to implement it as density functions. Um, the likelihood minus the log of Q of phi of z given x. So again, this was our notation q sub phi of z given x, where we say, well, really what we mean is q with the, with the variation parameters uh, g phi of x. Now, one way um, to rewrite this, and um, this will also be a problem in the problem set, but it's really just a one-liner, is then you can interpret this as, um, you, you can take out um, the posterior distribution, and um, you can interpret that as, as the negative expectation, oh, sorry, you can take out the likelihood here. Um, so you can interpret that as the negative of that, expectation over that, log p theta of x given c. Actually, it should be the 
positive one here. This is the plus sign. The likelihood. And then the remaining terms, if you look at this part and this part, these are all functions, these are all probability distributions over z, so over the thing where we um, sample from, where we take the average over. So um, these actually conspire to a, an information theoretical measure for these uh, functions, and we've introduced this before. This is just the KL divergence the kalbach liedler divergence between um, q phi, because that's the one over which we average, of uh, c given x, and the model, the prior of the model. And remember, we want to maximize the elbow. So maximize this so since there's a minus sign here that means we minimize the KL divergence but at the same time we maximize this expected um, log likelihood so how can you think about that um, well there's actually a lot of of machine learning methods that just maximize the log likelihood. In, in fact, maximum likelihood estimation is a, is a common method for, um, for training models. So if you had just this term in your objective function, if you were, were to ignore this last term, you would just maximize this part. Just maximizing only this part, that would be maximum likelihood estimation. Now, to be more precise, in maximum likelihood estimation, you actually only maximize this part. But if you can think of this, this function, this log, this log likelihood as a function of c, so this for any given um, x, this is a function of c. Now you want to maximize that. Maybe has a shape, some shape. Maybe like this. Um, then, and you maximize it over both these parameters, these model parameters, and the parameters of the variational distribution. Well, the best thing is you can that you can do is you just sit, find a point that's only on this just find this maximum and then make the variance so just sample always this point so that means you make that you learn here you're free to learn any variance of this distribution that you want so it's always best to just learn the variance zero so to learn a variational distribution that collapses if you were only to maximize this part then you will learn a variational distribution that just collapses to the point that is has the maximum likelihood so this would um, So maximizing only this part would mean need to maximum likelihood estimation. So more precisely, it would make Q phi of C given X. So this variational distribution would make it collapse to a delta function. So a delta function is just an, an infinite has least uh, a distribution that has an infinitesimally small peak, so that's really sharply peaked at just one point, um, where the peak, in this case, um, delta function peaked at the MLE, so MLE is maximum likelihood estimation, um, yeah, peaked at the LM MLE, so at the maximum of this, so at the MLE, which is arc max over Z, of uh, log p theta of x comma c. And then obviously would not only learn the variation parameters, you would also learn 
the model parameters. So you'd, if you were only to maximize this part, then you would learn a model such that its maximum likelihood estimation has um, highest, highest possible probabilities on the data where you evaluate it. And um, at the same time, you'd also learn how to find this uh, peak of the, um, of the likelihood given some data, because you'd also learn these variational distributions, which will then just be delta functions of peaks at, the, at this R max. But luckily, this is not the only part in the objective function. So this is not the only part that we maximize. We also have this part. And now, since this comes with a minus sign, this we actually minimize this part. And um, the minus sign, by the way, just comes from the fact that the definition of the KL divergence has a plus sign here and a, a minus sign here. So this additional term, you can think of that as a something like a regularization term. Think of this as a regularizer. And so what we want to do is, so the KL divergence is a measure we've proved on the problem sets that it is never negative. And so it's a measure of distance between probability distributions. It is zero if these probability distributions are equal, because then you just have uh, this term and this term would just cancel out everywhere. Uh, but if they are not equal, then it's, um, then it's strictly positive. So if you minimize this because of the minus sign, then we try to make these two probabilities as similar as possible. So uh, tries to make uh, q q phi of c given x um, similar to um, the prior. So this is one way to think about this second term here, this KL term between um, the approximate posterior and the prior. And this interpretation really concerns the uh, the training procedure. Now, once you employ this model for, um, for compression, um, you can also interpret this term. And so when you use this method for compression, then you would typically map some input data to some output by using this, um, this variational distribution. For example, you might choose the peak, the, the mode of the um, variational distribution as um, some latent variable that you want to encode. And then you would encode this latent variable in a lossless compression scheme that needs a probability distribution in order to define its code books or in order to just work. Yeah. Now that probability distribution that you then take for in order to compress this value z, that has to be a probability distribution that the decoder knows. So it cannot be this variational distribution because that's something that the decoder doesn't know because it depends on the data. So in order to compress this data, you actually want to encode it with the prior, because that's something that the decoder knows. So at compression time, so when we deploy this method for compression, we want to, to encode um, a value z using um, the prior. And then this term makes sure that the value C that we get out is actually has a high probability under the prior. So it, the precise uh, way to do this kind of then depends on how exactly you choose Z given some variational distribution. But generally speaking, this term helps to make sure that um, the things that you want to encode actually have a high probability under the prior, which means that they have low information content so that it can be encoded into a short bit stream. Yeah. Ensures that um, C obtained from encoder have high P theta of C. So that is one way how you can think about this, um, this elbow. Another way to think about it is um, you can group these terms in a different way. So another way to think about this is, and again, you will derive this in the problem set, and this will be a few more steps, but also not too hard. You can show that uh, you can pull out 
the marginal likelihood of the data. And then the rest, sorry, is just um, the negative, again, a kalbach liebler divergence. to the variational distribution from the, um, the true posterior. And this is in fact how variational inference often gets introduced. So in variational inference, you often start from this term, the, this KL divergence, and you say, I want to minimize this part. Why would you want to minimize this? Well, let me actually use, use a new color because it's yet a third term here. So minimizing this So it's, again, it's minimized because you maximize the elbow um, and there's a minus sign here. So we minimize then effectively this scale divergence. And by minimizing this, we make sure that this um, variational distribution, which we always said um, approximates the posterior. Well, here we literally see it because we minimize a distance measure between the approximate posterior and the true posterior. So this is one term in this um, objective that tries to get the two close. So this minimizes, um, so minimizing this makes, oops, the approximate or make the variational distribution, let me say it in this way, distribution Q by similar to the true posterior. And this is why you will all often uh, see um, Q phi can be called the approximate posterior. because that is um, what you minimize. So and if you were just, if you were given a fixed model with given parameters, which is something that also a lot of people are interested in, and you just then are interested in performing, very, performing Bayesian inference in that, um, that is also a, a, a very important application of variational inference, then you actually only have to consider this part because then this part would be a constant. And then you literally just um, try to make sure that the variational distribution mimics the posterior distribution. But now in a variational order encoder, we also say, or in general in a variational expectation setup, we also say that the model has some parameters that, are, um, that we optimize over. So then we again have two competing terms. So one term tries to minimize, um, the, to, tries to make the posterior distribution is the approximate posterior as close as possible to the true posterior. And this other term tries to make um, um, the evidence. So this is the evidence. And this will get maximized. So uh, we will maximize in this. And this really maximizes the theoretical lower bound on the compression performance for lossless compression. So uh, this is literally just the, or sorry, it minimizes it because it's the negative information content. So maximizing this um, minimizes the information content of X under our model. So you might think, well, that's really all we're interested in compression, but that's not quite true because um, there may be models out there that maybe have some optimal, um, that they may have some very uh, low information where they 
data that we want to compress has some very low information content, but we may not be able to actually then do this inference part for computational reasons. So that's why we also have to add this overhead that kind of measures, well, this is only the theoretical lower bound. So this is the, i.e. the theoretical lower bound of the bitrate. But this is really theoretical now, not only because we, uh, because of different coding algorithms, but also because we actually have to now find a method to encode that. And the typical method would be to map it first to a latent representation. And we may not be able to find the true posterior. For example, if we were to use bit spec coding, we may not be able to find the true posterior, this one here um, to use in bit spec coding. So this term measures the overhead that we get if we use a wrong, um, a wrong posterior, slightly wrong posterior, approximate posterior for bit spec coding. So these are two equivalent interpretations really of the elbow. But really what you have to do now is you have to, um, if you have a model architecture, which is given by an encoder and a decoder network, so function f and g, which parameterize these um, uh, the approximate posterior and the likelihood, and you also have a model for the prior, then you just have to implement um, this function. Um, average over it from the approximate posterior and then maximize that. But that will actually be a non-trivial task. And that is um, the final point that I'll make here. So go is to maximize the elbow. Over theta and phi. And now there's one kind of final issue that can be resolved, and you will resolve it on the problem set. But there's this um, issue that the elbow of theta and phi is a function which where you average over sample c. So you can approximate this average by actually sampling point c from this distribution. But this distribution itself depends on on phi, on the parameter of which you want to um, want to uh, optimize. So z given x of something. So now the question is, how do you, um, so here, the distribution from which you sample, so if you implement this in practice, you would not write out this, you wouldn't write out this expectation value as in high dimensional integral, you'd actually just sample points from this distribution and then estimate this expectation value. So the distribution from which we have to sample depends on the parameter on phi, by which we want to differentiate because we want to calculate the gradients of the elbow with respect to both theta and phi. To differentiate. So this is the final complication that comes in here is how do we actually differentiate by, um, so if you differentiate that, you can think of that as um, measuring how the elbow changes if I change phi slightly. Well, if I change phi in here slightly, then I can just measure that right, by just taking the uh, expect, uh, taking the derivatives of everything that's in here. But if I um, change phi slightly here, then that will actually lead to different samples that you will sample. So how can you kind of take that into account that changing phi slightly here will lead to different samples? And that's what you will do on the problem set. But to make these notes um, complete, um, there are um, two ways how you can, the two mainstream ways how you can do this. So one would be um, uh, the so-called uh, reparameterization gradients. Reparameterization. <laughs> 
and they're usually um, the better method to go for if they work because they usually lead to lower variance so can be optimized faster and these are due to Kingman values so from the VAE paper which was 2013 um, but they don't always work. So it's particularly if you have discrete um, Zs, discrete latent variables, they don't work. Um, and then you have to use um, a kind of the most generic other method would be the reinforced gradients. And they're called like this because they come from reinforcement learning where there's, they're, um, a simple, similar trick is often used. And those gradients were first introduced in the VI literature and the variational inference literature uh, by Ranganath and um, Raj Rajesh Ranganath and collaborators uh, in 2014. And again, I will list the precise references at the end uh, of the lecture notes. Once you look at the problem set, you may ask the question, well, in the end, well, we've gone through all this theory. In the end, implementing them is actually very simple. Why did we even bother to go through all this theory? Well, um, I think it's really important to remember all this theory, where this all comes from, because in the end, um, if you want to do research on these things, you don't want to just re-implement what's there. You want to um, come up with new ideas. And um, understanding where these things come from will allow you to, um, to improve upon the methods. So, um, let me briefly make a few comments there. So why all the fuss? So why do we need to learn all this theory? Well, now that you understand where these variational order encoders come from and how they relate to variational inference and approximate Bayesian inference and all these ideas, you can actually just look into that literature and say, oh, there's actually there's a lot of work going on that improves these methods and can we just also use that for compression? So for example, so... You know, ongoing going research on variational inference and related methods um, that may may be applicable to compression Well, or it may not be. Because compression really has additional constraints and has uh, different objectives than usually when you think about variational inference. So look into that literature. And try out whether it works for compression. If it improves, or if it helps to improve compression methods. So as a few concrete examples, um, we've seen that um, variational order encoders work by optimizing the elbow, the evidence lower bound, which as the name says, is a lower bound on the model evidence. Um, now, there's a lot of research going on in the variational inference or approximate inference community that tries to come up with new formulations of bounds that are actually closer to the, the model evidence. So lots of research on uh, tighter bounds. Uh, of the evidence, so tighter than than the elbow, than than the standard elbow, and a lot of that times that helps for inference or for other tasks for representation learning maybe, but it's not clear really for all of these methods, whether they actually help for compression, because um, for example, we derived the elbow actually as the bitrate of bit spec coding. So 
um, if you want to encode a model with bits by coding, then maybe the true elbow is actually the thing that you want. Um, but there might there are actually still um, improvements for that. So for example, there's a method called um, importance weighted EG um, importance weighted uh, VI, and then there is recent work applied. to compression um, and that was by by Lucas Tice and Jonathan Ho in this year. So this would be called importance weighted compression. Again, the references are at the end of the lecture notes. And this was actually non-trivial because it was not clear. So importance weighted VI was uh, has, had been known for a couple of years, but it actually optimizes a different bound than the bitrate of bits by coding. So it's not even clear that now optimizing this bound actually helps for compression, but what this paper comes up with is a kind of new compression method, so when, um, that's kind of more a variant of bits by coding, that, uh, resemble, that then leads to this importance weighted bound, and they show that that actually helps for compression. Another example um, is, um, so now that you know that this um, encoder network of a VAE, what it really does, it just performs approximate Bayesian inference. And you now know that the fact that we're using a neural network for that is not because we, that's the only thing that can give us this um, data. If you allow me to go back to the model. Um, so here, you know that, um, that this part, the encoder network, um, really just performs inference over this part, over the decoder network. So um, the only reason why we're actually using a neural network to do this is to speed up the training process. But if you have a lot of time, a lot of computational resources for compression, maybe you're compressing a video as a streaming service and you want this video to be, you have a lot of budget to compress it because it will be then streamed a lot of times. So paying a little bit more for compression will be worth it if you can save a few more bytes for every single video stream. Then instead of using an, an inference network here, a learned network, um, you can instead actually go back and say, well, we have this decoder network, let's just do iterative um, inference in this again at compression time. So this, let's just do this um, inner loop that we had, um, sorry, here. Let's just run this in a loop now at compression time rather than training time. Um, and let's see if we can get a better compression rate with that. And that was indeed tried. So that is iterative. And you can actually use hybrid methods where you use the decoder, the learned decoder network to, uh, to predict a good initialization of the uh, variational parameters, but then do um, perform iterative inference on top of that. So um, that would be it, iterative amortized inference. Um, which was first proposed in the VI literature by Marino et al, Joe Marino et al, in 2018. It was then applied to compression by Campos et al. And in a simplified version in 2019. And finally, you've now seen that you can actually understand variational autoencoder, you can understand what the term variational means because they do variational inference. And variational inference is really just a method that performs approximate Bayesian inference in a way that um, is computationally feasible. So it approximates the true Bayesian inference um, such that it saves computational um, costs. But there are actually other methods that also save computational costs. So other alternatives, other approximate Bayesian inference methods. Um, 
so alternatives to VI. exist, in particular um, so-called sampling methods or Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, in particular Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC. And it's not at all trivial, so these sometimes work better than variational inference, but it's not at all trivial how you could use them for compression in still a scalable way. There's some initial work here, so pioneering work. Uh, by Havasi and collaborators. Uh, from the year 2018. But this approach really still, um, it either doesn't scale very well, or if you make it scalable, then it gives up a lot of the advantages of, um, of these Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So I think there's still actually in this area, a lot of research, a lot of very interesting research to be done, how you can use these other methods, these competitors to variational inference for um, for compression methods. So again, if you found these derivations in this video a bit overwhelming, then I highly encourage you to look at the current problem set, which is linked in the video description. And that will really show you that um, what comes out of these derivations um, is something that you can actually, the plain vanilla variant of that is very easy to implement and it's relatively easy to train these models. Um, but in order to then do research on top of that, it's really important to understand what exactly where everything comes from and what it actually means. So with that, have fun with the problem set.